is a shock. I, I don't think most people are expecting that, and especially, you know, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, when people were desperately in need of getting out into nature and 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 uh, and uh, refilling themselves with a bit of hope and 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 uh, and renewal, uh, to get these sorts of messages that our best places were under threat. So um, that's really one of the things we're still watching. I, it seems like the government considers consultation to be talking to their friends, not to all of us. And so we have things like the new Red Tape Reduction Act, which uh, includes provisions that, that reduce the need for public consultation and enable the minister to arbitrarily uh, do things like open up our provincial parks and our wildland parks to motorized use. Uh, and then most recently, he's designated a bunch of trails, officially designated them under the Trails Act. The Trails Act was not bad legislation. It has a lot of potential. It also has a lot of potential to go, go sideways. Uh, it really depends on whether you've got a good government working with it. But um, these designated trails, I, I, I actually, I asked around I, uh, people in the conservation community, I said, so, you know, is this good or bad, these trails, or these maps? And nobody, had, nobody knew anything about it. Uh, the minister had not talked to anybody about it. So um, at least nobody that, nobody that I talked to. So it might be just that if you just talk to your... Um, you know, maybe a few off-road enthusiasts and your 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 um, your funders that that's considered a consultation, but that's not really what I think most Albertans want. So I think there's a great deal of distrust and concern about what does this government really think about us, and what does this government really think about our best places, and can we count on them to protect the things that we love about the about the wild? We aren't getting a lot of positive signals, and uh, and but we've had some pretty really shocking negative signals. So I think that's that's the big thing here. Is you know there there's there's a lot of lot of just un unclarity about um, what's going on up there. Uh, no confidence that 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 we have a government that even gets it, that that really understands that uh, that Albertans are defined as much by our as much as we're defined by our oil and our economy and our and our concerns we are also concerned defined by our love of where we live and our, uh, our 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 determination to keep this a good place to live in um so yeah that that's 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 the um the big concern these things all these things all become cumulative um you get a bunch of negative messages you know and so currently right now you know um there's a, a leadership campaign going on with the united conservative party um, so what comes out of that? Do we get a, a chance to restore our confidence or do they double down on this uh, attack on, on nature and a, an attack on consultation? Really hard to read, really hard to read. They, um, it's just a real disconnect. Um, this is our place. Uh, they should be talking to us about it. Yeah, it's like you don't, you don't necessarily think that parks are going to come up in conversations through a party leadership contest, but that's also kind of one of the things that matter a lot to people, right? I think with political discourse, when we host a show like this, I oftentimes think we need to talk more about what people actually care about and not always like the political science side of things, the high level strategy stuff. People care about what hits them in the face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you think about where we are in history right now, it, you know, it's not just a little parksy thing. Um, the, these are actually pretty fundamental uh, we are in the middle of um, a great deal of uncertainty about what's going to happen to us, you know, with our climate. And, and you know, most of the models are predicting that we're going to get a lot more evaporation in the summer because of heat. We're going to get uh, less snow in the winter, more rain. Um, water is becoming a huge issue. Uh, our whole economy depends on water. So, um, where does the water come from? The water comes from the eastern slopes, from the area that they wanted to strip mine, from the area where they wanted to close the parks. Uh, so it may not be a parks issue for some people, but by golly, we all need water. And, and we're all facing a future where we're going to have less confidence in our ability to actually uh, run our economy, run our, our communities, and, 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 and turn on the tap and actually find good water there. So that's a big piece. Another one is that you know we're, we're still in the business of selling oil and gas to the world. And the oil and the world is becoming much more difficult to sell those sorts of carbon-based fuels too. We need some good news stories, and we need them on the environmental side because they are the ones that will buffer the bad news about 
the fact that uh, unfortunately when you burn these fuels you add carbon to the atmosphere and that drives a lot of things that uh, make the future uncertain so um, you know getting it right on the conservation side is not just making a few tree huggers happy it's actually protecting our future as a province it's fundamentally important and that's something that this government simply does not seem to get Kevin Van Tiggum, it's always great to have you on the show. Really appreciate your, your advocacy, your perspective here, and, of course, your continued involvement. We've been uh, putting these, these web addresses up as we've been showing your name on the screen uh, on YouTube. But for the benefit of people that are listening to the podcast, I think it would, you know, people are going to hear this and they're going to say, well, how do I get involved or, or how can I be an advocate or how can I show that I care? How can I contribute my efforts? And, and people can check out naturecanada.ca, Nature Conservancy of Canada. We mentioned the Livingstone Landowners group, livingstonelandowners.net. Is there anything else you want to mention in closing uh, for people, engaged citizens looking to get involved and have their voices heard? Well, I, I, I'm kind of impressed with this Outdoor Recreation Co- um, uh, Coalition of Alberta. And they can you can find them if you Google, you know, Outdoor Recreation Alberta. Um, I, I like the fact that we have a group that's coming together uh, to protect the interests of people that like to travel lightly on the land. Uh, uh, you know, horseback, hiking, bicycling, but but the, the low impact activities. Um, I, so I think that's another group that I, I would mention, but certainly supporting local conservation groups, querying your politicians, especially those that want to be leaders of the UCP or those that might want to be elected uh, in the next government next spring. Uh, you know, uh, we get the kind of government that we are prepared to work for. So I think that active citizenry is probably more value, more important now than ever before. So yeah, just get involved in whatever way you can. Uh, it's, um, it's all part of being, uh, being committed to the future of Alberta. Yeah. Well said. Thanks, Kev. Enjoy the rest of your day in beautiful Canmore. It's good to see you again. Thanks, Ryan. It's great yeah. talking to you. Yeah, you bet. Uh, and again, our apologies for the technical interruptions. It's kind of funny. We've been getting some, some funny feedback from people. Some people are taking the time to email us. One one guy said if these he said he said if these technical difficulties continue he said he's going to stop watching, <laughs> and and I'm trying to I'll, try, I'll, I'll count to a thousand before I respond because I'm not sure if he thinks he's more frustrated than we are. I don't know. And I'm pretty sure he's to not. Keep our faces, you know, like, <laughs> like that we're, we're not. Like, do 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 yeah. do do. I want to say the name of our I provider, say but the I'm name not going to. Our provider, but we're not going to. Hey, listen, we're keeping it classy here on the. And also, everything's cool. You know, we're what a great good. morning hanging out with Kevin Van Tiggum. We're going to be talking to Caitlin Osmond a little bit, Olympic gold medalist. My dad's going to come hang out with us today. I'm super excited about that. Nothing could go wrong from here on out. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what? It feels like the right time to talk about Kubi Energy. Cool. We talk about park protection, environmental awareness, advocacy. What about going green? What about achieving your net zero goal? It might be at your family's property, which is off the grid, or you're trying to get it off the grid. Maybe it's a a farm. Maybe it's a big commercial complex. Who knows? Uh, You can learn more about what Kubi Energy does and their installations at kubienergy.ca. You check out the website and you can get a free free quote there at kubienergy.ca. It's also a good time to remind you about Park Power because uh, people that are, first of all, going ahead and investing in solar are going to realize through the summer months Right where the you know June, July, August, the sun's up for like 18 hours. Your system's going to be creating more than you need. Park Power is going to pay you more to buy that back than any other provider. Just ask them. Go check it out right now at parkpower.ca. When you bring your business over to Park Power, make sure you use the promo code 2022-REALTALK. It's going to get you $70 off your first bill. No strings attached. Pretty cool stuff. Also, a big shout out to our friends at Eden Landscaping. We've been talking to you about this move away from sod, right? You get your new dream home. It's in this new neighborhood. It's got all the walking paths and you're close to the schools. But then you look out at your your front yard and if you're being honest, it's kind of uninspired. Just a bunch of grass, that one lonely tree. It's what the builder included. Eden Landscaping can help you ramp that up. Put the lawnmower away. Why not invest in this urban front yard butterfly approach? Yeah, it attracts pollinators. It's great for the environment, plus less work for you. Whatever your vision, they'll execute it with precise attention to detail. 
Check out Eden Landscaping online at landscapeedmonton.ca. And while you're checking out our sponsors, we got an amazing note yesterday from somebody that had checked out Infinity Healthcare. I wanted to read this email. Did you see this one come in, Johnny? This was awesome from Francine. I did. Francine writes in, says, I wanted to let you know because I listened to Real Talk. Thank you. I was able to refer a friend to check out Infinity Healthcare. They're so impressed with the service. I would not have found out about Infinity Healthcare if they wouldn't have been a sponsor on Real Talk. That from Francine, amazing. And we're just happy to know that your loved one's home care needs are being met by a team that cares, that operates with empathy, that finds that perfect fit. You can find them online at infinity-8.ca. In just a few minutes, what's shaking, pal? We were just... So, Caitlin, Olymp- yeah. Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, world champion figure skater. She's having computer issues. That's okay. I feel like this is one of those days. And you know what? Honestly, if it doesn't work out today, we'll book her on the show tomorrow. No. So, she troubleshot the issues yeah. like we did. She's installing an update, and it's going to take about six and a half minutes for That's her amazing. to we'll be get back. her computer First back of all, on. we can go out to Jasper. Second yeah, of all, let's do it. the doctor's in the house. My dad's already hanging out. Here. I we'll just gave everyone just, a sneak peek. There. You gave him a little sneak peek on the wide <laughs> shot? Yeah. I love it. Well, every Wednesday, thanks to our friends at Tourism Jasper, we have a chance to kind of, I guess, maybe reset our perspective or, or maybe remind ourselves of the beauty that surrounds us out in Jasper National Park. We call it My Jasper Memories. And today, I want to take you to one of the most iconic landmarks in Canada's Rocky Mountains. If you've been lucky enough to visit Spirit Island, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's enjoyed no shortage of adoration, that's for sure. Here's what you need to know about this beautiful, off-the-beaten-path island, which has captured worldwide imagination. And one of the best ways to experience it for yourself. I want to take you in there. Now, this is only accessible by boat. And so one of the best ways to see it is with Pursuit. We did that as a family last summer. The guiding company, formerly known as Brewster Travel Canada, you know that company. They've been providing visitors with the opportunity to discover Spirit Island and surrounding area for more than 60 years through their interpretive boat cruises. You get panoramic views of these jagged mountain peaks. They're stunning. They surround the glacier-fed waters of magical Moline Lake. Um, the boats are heated, which is important, especially in the early morning. Uh, glass enclosed. They take you to and from the world-famous Spirit Island. You can observe in awe and listen while a knowledgeable guide retells Moline's history. And they don't omit the uncomfortable stuff either, which we really appreciated. It was real talk on that Spirit Island boat tour. Uh, they explain its geology, the wildlife, the weather, the flora, the fauna, the relationship of indigenous people on that land to the parks to spirit island it's 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 a an area of great significance to indigenous people that have visited for time immemorial the boat cruise is opening this friday uh, june 10th and uh, i encourage you to check it out of course if you want to learn more about spirit island about pursuit if you want to learn more now now maybe the the cruise this is worth noting because some people may have been trying to check this out for the last little while the opening was delayed due to the slow thawing of ice at Moline lake so make sure you do confirm the date before you book that's one of the cool parts about it, though, right? Is this just like hardcore nature out there? Absolutely stunning. You can learn more by checking out jasper.travel slash real talk. Uh, and then, of course, you can link to our past segments. But as you can see right here, cruising to Spirit Island, you can book now and watch and listen to the episode. All the resources there, jasper.travel slash real talk. How are we doing with our world champ? Oh, we needed that Jasper memory today just to calm down. Just to remind us, I always say fill our lungs, metaphorically speaking. He says a couple more minutes. Fresh air. Well, why don't we welcome my dad in? Tell Caitlin hey. that we'll get to her in just a little bit. This is this is an amazing treat, and this is super cool. We're having a weird morning, which you wouldn't have known because you've been in transit, dropping off our little guy, Wyatt, at grade one and, and everything else. But, uh, yeah, we've been having, like, technical. The show's been all over the map the last couple of days from a technical and, and circumstances outside of our control. And so uh, we were looking forward to getting you here in studio. It's a little bit easier to keep it going when we're just face-to-face like this. Well, I've enjoyed just sitting here and listening and watching <laughs> what goes on in the live studio. Yeah, this is uh, this is a special trip for me yeah. to have you sitting across the table. Very glad to be here. Yeah, I was telling glad everybody. Glad to return. Yeah. You and I have done some radio together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
that was it. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity. This was when you were still had you you hadn't even retired yet. I don't think when you came in and did that interview with no, me no, on the radio I was station. Some years uh, mm -hmm. away from that. At that point, little did I know, really. Yeah, you know, what was in store for both of us? Yeah. Both of yeah. both of those careers of ours, yeah. kind of coming to an end ahead of the date that we maybe had in mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. retired. Uh, I guess about are we are we coming up on like three years ago? It was uh, family medicine. Was, by the way, I should mention yeah. a doctor in south right. southwest Calgary. Yeah, it was it was nineteen in twenty nineteen. Yeah, in sort of middle of the year June. And you had uh, and I remember sort of ob observing you go through this process, and it's quite a thing when a family doc uh, wraps up practice and makes a move to the transition because you have literally thousands of patients you got to communicate with, and there's the kind of the stuff that matters to people like what yeah. happens to my medical yeah. records or do I have a new family doctor or how's this going to work for me and then for you a big process as well right yeah you you you, you need to communicate with folks about all those things but you want to as well you yeah know, these people who you've been seeing and you've known for months and, and years and uh, lifetimes many of them you want to you want to be in touch and express your gratitude and give them some help making that transition when it's needed and and so forth and you weren't necessarily yeah. looking to retire in 2019 no i sure wasn't it was it was the advent of a of a mm. challenge that that uh, mm. sort of prompted you to say well maybe i can't bring a hundred percent to the table literally maybe to the operating yeah. table yeah. no i couldn't do that no uh, that's right it wasn't it, it was coerced at least in part although you know at, at, at my age at that point some do retire but i wasn't quite ready but it was coerced with waking up one morning with this shake uh hand and later foot and leg and then it switched over to the other side and so forth and and in time uh got the diagnosis of parkinson's uh, disease and uh, so we that brought about this uh, the retirement you know and uh we've been doing our best and battling with it ever since mm -hmm. it hasn't been too bad actually fortunately uh, although it's a progressive condition that it's been progressing very slowly, and so I'm hopeful for that. Yeah, I remember the I remember the the day that the diagnosis was made official. Although you knew, I mean, you're you're a you were a physician for forty plus years. Right. You you forty five years. Right? You knew that. Uh, I think you knew what it was, but but a neurologist actually made the diagnosis, right. correct? Right. But I remember I was at yes. that time. Johnny and I were working together. This is going to make me cry, but uh, we're working in Oilers game and uh mom called me and I was downstairs at the rink and <laughs> I've told oh. you this story before mm -hmm. and I already had like my earpiece in and the microphone like ready to go and there's 18,000 people <laughs> screaming uh -huh. and she called and just said yeah it's Parkinson's and I just kind of like just felt like this punch to the stomach and then the next thing you're like we're looking for the loudest fans <laughs> and I was just like trying not to lose it uh sure but uh, since that diagnosis, it's been like, it's been a situation almost where if I can say, maybe this, I hope this doesn't sound weird. We've been like counting our blessings because you take a look, I'm going to be talking tomorrow to Kelsey Snow. You know, her husband, Chris mm -hmm. is the assistant GM of the Calgary yes. Flames, a uh, young guy, Story. remarkable family. Um, and then she's got this podcast, sorry, I'm sad. Yeah. And we're going to talk about grief and trauma and those types of things and, and ALS has swooped in on their family. Chris is amazing. He posts videos. Have you seen the he posts videos of him feeding himself with a feeding tube and then he's outside mowing the lawn. I saw that very video. <laughs> like, it's, it's really takes you back. It's, yeah. And so you think with a diagnosis like a what do you call it? Like a neurodegenerative yes. disease that it could be ruthless. And, and to this and point so far often is. You, yeah. it feels like you've just been kind of holding it at bay. I don't know how mm -hmm. to put it. Yeah, that's probably as good as any. Yeah, we're we're you know getting more active than we were before, and that yeah. seems to be making a difference. And uh, you know, uh, we've so we sort of walking Catherine and I, and rediscovered the ping pong table downstairs. Which I love is, it, which gives you if you go at it really quite a remarkable workout. And my neurologist concurs, so we're going to continue that way and 
take it one day at a time as it goes. Yeah, it's amazing. It was just Parkinson's Awareness Month and through the month of April. And obviously, yeah. as a family, we pay attention to that kind of stuff. What's, what's maybe one thing as a, as a longtime healthcare practitioner, um, when you talk to people about Parkinson's Awareness, maybe what's one thing that you learned about it or realized about it that you didn't know, or maybe it wasn't totally on your radar, until it hit you personally? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the different presentations that it can have. In my particular case, it was tremor, which, which is, uh, you know, progresses involving, you know, one arm, one leg to start and often switching over to the other and so forth. But uh, uh, the other sort of manifestations of, of it are, you know, stiffness and slow movement, falling, things of that nature. But fortunately, I've, I've landed on tremor, which can be not always, but can be the the uh, the slowest form of it, or the form of it uh, slowest to mm-hmm. advance or progress. You know, we're so the, a little good news uh, amidst the not so good news and and the surprise. It's so, real life, yeah. right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I I expected at some point I'd be retired from my profession. But I didn't quite anticipate or foresee this scenario. And yeah. Maybe who does, right? You yeah. Know? Although we as a family are always uh, excited to see you channel your uh, creativity and passion and, and uh, intellect into other areas too. And, and I've shared in past, and maybe not necessarily even on Real Talk, I've read a couple emails from you on Real Talk over our year and a half or so that we've been doing the show, but the radio show before that, the television show before that, you've... You've, you, you do a lot of writing. You're a, you, you don't describe yourself as a poet, but you are. And, uh, and so it's been, uh, I don't know, you've got this, uh, I don't know, I feel like this whole other, I'm, I'm curious to see where your writing is going to go in the next number of years, yeah. which uh, is something that I, don't, I know you don't necessarily want pressure heaped on your shoulders. Yeah, but. Yeah, it, it would be nice, but one thing I've discovered about writing is that it's, uh, it's slogging. Yeah, and it's it's hard work sometimes, and sure, there's here and there, there's the odd inspiration. So, but a lot of it is is really just keeping at it. And yeah, but you don't mess around. I like mm. it because you write about things like uh, you know all the serious stuff. You write about the contentious stuff. You write about the stuff that winds up in front of the Supreme Court or in front of you know. I mean, and and, and that's why I've always appreciated your perspective because I, I hope that it's it's not a lost art. Uh, people having the ability to to take a position or to take a stance on something and to argue that stance and to put it through the washer and then see if it stands up to criticism and debate. And, and I don't know. I just feel like, you know, I learned that a little bit around our family dinner table and around your parents' uh, Sunday dinner table, sure. um, your dad, Stan, your mom, Norma. I mean, I, I just remember those Sunday dinner tables at their house in Elbow Park in South yeah. Calgary uh, being home to some pretty fantastic conversations. I was 10 years old just trying to sit there and listen to them all. Yeah, but. And all, all of it laced with, uh, not, not not a little fun. And yeah, joking. And yeah, even absurdity and yeah, and that that was sort of part of it. That's what I family's recall. all about. I, yeah. Johnny, can we show that picture that I have of my dad? This is a cherished photo. The people on the podcast will describe it. This is you uh, in what you're you're delivering. A, this is a baby. Probably you you did oh, yes. what, what you you're 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 not a uh, an OBGYN, but you did obstetrics for yeah. many many years yeah, how many babies did you deliver of, through your of, career yeah a lot of family docs that's a part of their practice and and they love it and uh, it disrupts the heck out of everything else because you know babies don't wait yeah and when it when it calls you gotta go you gotta leave um and and, and so it was with me but you know that uh uh, yeah, I had a, a, a reasonably uh, good, high experience or reasonably good experience. I didn't have a very busy obstetrical practice, as some docs do. But over the years, we've probably attended, you know, four or 500 uh, births, that kind of enough to be touched by its wonder and magnificence. And, and of course, that's what brought your, your mom and myself up these last few days yeah that sort of wonder calgary papa and grandma i was talking about is as you've uh, helped us welcome little noah oh. to the family your seventh grandchild uh if i'm doing the math correctly yeah, <laughs> yeah. Seven, and right. uh, and uh yeah it's been amazing to see you with him and um and especially leading up to i mean your birthday's coming up but but also to father's day it's just really special to yeah. have you here for it well noah is such a beauty and to look him so look at him is so perfect and wondrous, and realized that he just came through that 
battle or, or that uh, that uh, journey of, of centimeters, but which nonetheless can be perilous. Yeah. Just as it is oh, yeah. wondrous. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, I mean, I remember like you're in there in the, you know, in labor and delivery and the, they have the, the heart rate monitor, the fetal heart rate monitor, whatever you'd call it. And you can hear it and they go, oh, the baby's heart rate's dropping. We got to move here. We got to shift mom around. And you're, and you're like, you, <laughs> for me, a non medical professional, the heart rate's dropping. Wait, what? You know, they got the NICU teams there and everything. It's just, just absolutely wild. Yeah, um, yeah you, you got to know the, the, the people who are there are there because of their wealth of experience and knowledge and they know when to hold them and they know when to fold them and, <laughs> yeah. and what to do at the moment, you know. And uh, Yeah, it was, a, it was a great life, that aspect of, of the family practice. And uh, I put it away some while ago, but thankful for it. Pops, be uh, before I go, I wanted to ask you about family medicine. Um, you were a proud family doc uh, for a lot of years, and um, and uh, you know people wonder about the current state of medicine, and people you know find it hard to find a family doctor. You know they look at, at recruitment, retention, family docs. Oftentimes, uh, the numbers seem to drop off a little bit more because of the amount of work that's involved, and and the fact that you're a you're a small business owner, an entrepreneur, and, and you're also a healthcare practitioner, and and people wonder. You know you've you've got these sort of primary care things. You got the twenty. 24 hour clinics. Uh, when you, when you take a look at, at, at the future of family medicine, um, obviously I know you're going to be very complimentary and you're, you've always shown that professional respect to the practitioners that do it, but, but do, are you concerned about the future of family medicine or when, when you left, uh, you know, in part because of the Parkinson's, where was your head at with regards to assessing the landscape, so to speak? Yeah, no, no, I, in answer to your question, I am hopeful for the future of family medicine, I think that that uh, it, it's it's bedrock on which the whole system is is built. Uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> not alone, but uh, part of it. And uh, so I'm hopeful for it. Uh, really, uh, I think uh, you know, look at what we've come through as a society, as personal, as individuals, as families, but also as a profession. Look what we've come through with this pandemic and although there was a lot of concern voiced in the in the, the, the throes of it at, the, at its most uh, worrisome moment there was a lot of concern about whether the system could handle it could manage that it or would may it collapse and and uh, I uh, I felt uh, all along that and still do that uh, you know the people that work in the profession including family practitioners would rise to the challenge and do what needed to be done, and I and I think that's what's happened, I, and I think it bodes well for the future. Were you? Oh, this is a hard question. I got, I, I was about to just throw the fastball right down the middle, but it, but it would have come across as editorialized, and I didn't mean to. Were you? Let were you? See. Were you relieved to, to dodge the bullet of the pandemic as a as a physician? You, you retired right before you didn't see it coming, obviously, and you retired because of your Parkinson's, not because yeah. of COVID nineteen. Or, or was it hard for you to be on the sidelines? I, I'll be honest with I was relieved you weren't practicing. To be honest with yeah. you, mixed feeling. Yeah, uh, uh, really, uh, and and I voiced that uh, to my neurologist and uh, said, uh, you know, I feel like I'm standing at the curbside. Uh, you know, with my hand on my heart, uh, sending the the real soldiers off to battle, as it were. Um, but uh, you know, no, I I had a good life, and the the timing was that I'd I'd been out of the profession for better part of a year or so when the and the pandemic uh, hit, and so it would have been a bit of an upgrade to get back into it and up to snuff and yeah. where, where you'd want to be to be active. So. Uh, it all settled all right with me, although initially I was, I was there was some uncertainty about, you know, whether I should even consider something such as a comeback. Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, I know you did. I know you. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Well, listen, pops, this is yeah. just it's so special for me to have you in here. I love you. I feel like this is just uh, uh, the audience is uh, responding to. I mean, our live audience. We've had a kind of a weird morning, technically speaking, and you just come in and as you have for for our entire lives you've just calmed the waters and uh i always appreciate that and we should give you a shout out as well john and we didn't even mention it when 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 doc rolled in here dr j the doctor in the house repping your real talk ryan jesperson t-shirt very well yes. done Pop. very nicely I, done i got a, i got the mug too that says keeping it real for since 
since 2020. 2020. Yeah, that's right. Of course, right. you've been keeping it real a lot longer than that. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. That's yeah. A, yeah, that's what we got me here in the first place. Um, I had a mug and coffee ready for you, and I just realized in the, in, in, in all the hubbub, in the, in the excitement of your arrival here at studio, I forgot to give it to you, but... If you want to hang out, uh, we're going to yeah. talk to Caitlin Osmond here. Looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead and grab a coffee, Pops. Thanks for joining us on the show. It would be impossible for me to love or respect you anymore. That's Dr. Bruce Jesperson. Kind of a fun little family angle on this morning's show. This is actually this the show. I know that we're, we've been a little frustrated, Johnny, underneath and behind the scenes and everything. But Caitlin's got her computer update done. She's ready to rock. We've got family members, beloved family members, and it's actually a beautiful morning. It's actually a great day. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Oh, what a beautiful morning! <laughs> All right, before we get to uh, world champion figure skater, Olympic gold medalist Caitlin Osmond, I want to remind you the show happens because of amazing sponsors that are with us through thick and. Th- Thin, like Friesen Brothers. Pick five for 25 bucks. It's back at Friesen Brothers. As a matter of fact, just this weekend, I picked five for 25 bucks. We loaded up on Smokies. We loaded up on chicken breasts. We loaded up on all kinds of things for the grill. Of course, at Friesen Brothers, they know that family is so important and so many special moments happen around that dinner table, don't they? If your dinners are going to include heating up the grill, you won't want to miss what Friesen Brothers has. They're real butchers ready to give you the custom cuts you're looking for. You can check out more at Friesen.com. At Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge, you will find Alberta's best selection of Dodge, Jeep, and of course, that Ram 1500 lineup. I tell you about my neighbor, Chad, just picked up the new crew cab Ram to pull his trailer. This thing is so beautiful. I have truck envy. I look outside. He found that perfect fit, walked into St. Albert Dodge, said, here's exactly what I'm looking for. Here's my budget. He was out of there in four hours. A happy customer. Another one from Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. At Local Environmental, our friends want to remind you that they're now touched down in Regina. If you're one of our Saskatchewan-based audience members, if you own a small business, big business, anything that requires waste or recycling management, portable toilets, water hauling, fencing, Local Environmental does it locally and family-owned. You can request a quote today at localenvironmental.ca. And don't forget, they present Trash Talk every Friday. Send us your rant. We encourage the humorous ones to talk at ryanjesperson.com. How you feeling, pal? Well, yeah. We're about to talk to somebody that's going to remind us that what we do every day is rather unspectacular. It's kind of fitting that she's coming on at the end. It almost works a little better today. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's up. She's been to the top. Uh, she has seen the mountaintop. Our next guest, is, as we tee this up, you're going to go, okay, you're excited to hear from Caitlin Osmond. She's uh, just an absolutely beloved Canadian athlete, obviously one of the best in the world at what she does. But but let's provide a little bit of context mm-hmm. here. Uh, just yesterday, figure skating's governing body announcing that the minimum age for competition will be raised to 17. Uh, now, they're not doing it right away. They ease it in, but it will impact the next Olympic Games, next Winter Olympic Games, where athletes will uh, need to be 17 years of age or older to compete. It's significant for a number of reasons, but but let's find out why. You don't want my opinion on it. No offense, Johnny. We don't need your opinion on it. What we need is the opinion of somebody that, that owns, that has earned an Olympic gold medal, a world championship. In 2018, Caitlin Osmond became Canada's first women's singles world figure skating champion in 45 years, and that was just a month after she won two medals at Pyeongchang 2018 the Winter Games bronze in women's singles amazing and helping Canada win gold in the team event she also helped make Canadian history back in 2017 at the World Championships where she won silver sharing the podium with bronze medalist her teammate Gabrielle Delman it was the first time two Canadian women had stood together on the World Championship podium thrilled to welcome you to Real Talk Caitlin it's nice to see your face again thanks for making time for us Thank you. And I apologize for all my tech issues. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Do you know what? All of your tech issues are, are, are second on the list because we've been having so many tech issues today. So we just, John and I just made a choice to laugh about it. And so we feel very liberated. Today's show actually has a really kind of a chill vibe to it. Surprisingly <laughs> enough. Are you, are we talking to you from Toronto? You're cause you're doing, you're studying towards a journalism uh, uh, degree right now, correct? Um, I actually took a break last year from journalism. Oh, I'm back living in Edmonton. 
Uh, I'm coaching pretty much full time, uh, but I'm going back to U of A starting in September for media studies. Oh, right on. Very cool stuff. Do you see do you see your future in like in storytelling or journalism? Are you looking down a, a sports uh, path as a, as a, a world champion athlete or, or is something else catching your attention? I don't know. I find every month that I've been in school in one aspect or another, um, I change my mind. <laughs> So I don't know. I like the sports world, but I really like just storytelling in general. Um, so maybe I'll find a mixture of both. It's It's got to be an interesting feel. I don't know if you can describe this to the rest of us. It might be like when you ask an astronaut to, you know, what's it like to walk on the moon? It's kind of like, well, you kind of got to be there to really understand when you, you have an Olympic gold medal, you have a world championship, uh, a career in athletics. I always find so fascinating because a lot of athletes like yourselves, you so you, you retire, so to speak. But you're in your like your mid twenties. A lot of people retire in their mid to late twenties. It's like you still have your whole life ahead of you. How do you approach something like that? It's been four years since I retired, and I'm still trying to figure out how to approach it. Um, but it is it is a weird feeling retiring. Like I was 22, 23 when I retired, and then I realized I had no schooling, I had no like real life experience, but I had so many credentials. So it's like a weird mix of like, who really are you? <laughs> um, so that's been a, a fun four years. Yeah, well, no kidding. And it, and it must be, I mean, what an interesting challenge to navigate that next stage of your life when you've accomplished so much already. I mean, I w- maybe there's a certain pressure that comes with it. Maybe that pressure is added to when interviewers point that sort of a thing out. I don't know. But let's talk about this decision yesterday. Uh, announced uh, by the International Skating Union in a vote 110 uh, yays, 16 nays. That's a pretty overwhelming vote to raise the minimum age of competition to 17. It's a sport, I mean, figure skating, gymnastics, where oftentimes 15-year-olds, like in the most recent Olympic Games, 15-year-olds can be the gold medal favorites. Uh, When you first heard about the decision or or the moves, the advocates... Uh, leading up to this, where where was your head at on it? Um, truthfully, I was surprised when it first uh, started getting leeway and started being talked about, about actually raising the age because so many times like rumors start that they're going to change it, but nothing ever happens. So to actually see something progress, I think that is an amazing thing. And I got really excited about it, but I really didn't know how to feel about it. And I found myself actually reaching out to people that I actually competed against and also my old coaches to get their opinions. I'm like, I think I like it, but like, where am I at? Because I was 17. I was at that bubble that they just aged the rate, raised the age to when I started on the international stage. So that's where I was at. Um, And I still felt young in that part. But then I also felt very old. So like, I don't know. It took a while for me to figure it out. It's interesting. I mean, all of the, it, it, a lot of the commentary yesterday and into today has centered around, and for obvious reasons, uh, Russian national champion, Kamila Valieva. Um, she competed at this year's Beijing Games and and she was, I, I think it's fair to say, the gold medal favorite. Um, there had been some controversy around her uh, with regards to a, a, a positive doping test ahead of the Olympic Games. And then, I, I mean, quite frankly she struggled it it feels almost weird to put it that way she's 15 years old I can't even imagine the pressure Um, but for a lot of people I think that was the moment whether they were involved with the sport or whether they were just fans where they said maybe we need to have a more meaningful or a more serious conversation about minimum age limits Uh, does it make sense that a lot of people are focusing on her story do you think I definitely think it makes sense because the Olympic games this year with the scandal, with her age, with the meltdowns following the event, it just became such a public thing. Um, Being in the skating world, yes, you see the stress and the pressures and stuff that happens behind the scenes with the tears. And you can see like the overwhelming stress on a lot of teenagers, but this time it was made public. And a lot of things have been made public, I think in the last two years, um, that started a lot of conversations and that was just the final straw to say, okay, it's time to make a difference. 
the Russians are not happy with the decision. I'm not sure if you've read some of the interviews, uh, but the, the, there was one quote in particular that jumped out at me. Uh, uh, Dmitry uh, Solovyev, a, a, a team event gold medalist uh, for Russia in Sochi in 2014, told the broadcaster Match TV, quote, I think this was done to more or less even out the competition so that our Russian female skaters couldn't have the opportunity to win world championship, European or Olympic medals, which was kind of interesting. Meantime, you take a look at what people are saying in Canada, uh, or I mean, even just with the International Union, the skating union, talking about why this was important to address, quote, burnout, disordered eating, and long-term consequences of injury, maybe before you know, these young athletes' bodies are even fully developed. When you take yourself back to that age, like 13, 14, 15, 16, can you try to help us understand what it's like, the pressure, the strain, the magnitude or the seriousness of the training, the toll it took on you mentally, physically, emotionally? Um, to be completely honest, when I was younger, I didn't notice a lot of that. And it wasn't until I was getting close to retirement. And then I did retire that I started looking back and realizing like how much I put myself like through stress. Um, and it just developed a lot of issues that I, that went underlying for so long. And they've really just come to light as I've gotten older. Um, but when I was 13, 14 years old, I went to my very first international competition in the junior, uh, junior age. And I had no triples. <laughs> I was, not the best skater. I hadn't gotten to like my high level um, part of my life yet. Um, and I stood on the ice with people the same age as me and they were doing triple, triple jumps, things that I never even seen before. And from then on, I started wanting to get that. And I pushed myself a lot harder once I got home from these competitions. And I went my entire life until I was 16 years old with never getting an injury. And once I was 16, I was always bombarded with them because I was pushing myself to get these dribbles, to be in shape, to be at a level that I wanted to compete at. And um, I'm proud that I did, of course, like I, I had a lot of accomplish, 